Thank you for worshiping with First Church. My name is Jody Ice, and I'm the senior pastor of First United Methodist in Johnson City, Tennessee. And we are so glad to share this time of worship with you. And if you enjoy this time of worship, we hope that you'll share it with others. That you'll lead them to our Facebook page or our YouTube site or our website so that they can experience what you've experienced today. We hope that you will participate fully in our worship service as we are continuing our study on the letter of 1 John. Please pray the prayers with us, sing the songs, join in the readings and the scripture lesson. And we hope that you will find yourself in the presence of God, wherever you are. Let us worship together. Please join me in reading the call to worship found on your screen. With great rejoicing, we enter the house of the Lord. We come to praise the one who is our refuge and our strength. Lift up your eyes, for God comes to us with compassion and love. We bring our burdened and broken spirits, seeking God's presence and healing. Rejoice! For the God who created you comes to redeem you and make you whole. We joyfully celebrate the living God who embraces us with mercy and calls us to new life. Let us pray. Majestic and awesome God, when we consider the vastness of your creation and the beauty of this earth, we stand amazed that you have chosen to notice us, to love us, and to call us your children. With humility and gratitude, we bring to you our scattered and unselfish lives. In our heart of hearts, we know that you alone can give us strength. We need to face the world's challenges, the peace we need to settle our souls, and the mercy we need to be free from our guilt and fears. Reveal yourself to us in this moment. Pour your love into our lives so that we may learn to live and act like Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing. 
nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me love lifted me Please join me in praying the prayer of confession. Holy God, because we live our lives in comfort and security, we must confess that we are often blinded to the possibility that we are even sinning. We confess our pride that dares not admit our mistakes. We confess our selfishness that can see nothing but our own desires. We confess our self-righteousness that accuses others but denies our own faults. We confess our callousness that causes us not to care. We confess our defiance that does not regret our harmful actions. We confess our evasion that seeks to rationalize our behavior. We confess our coldness of heart that hardens us to repentance. God. We are sinners. Have mercy on us. Forgive us, merciful God. Open our hearts and minds to follow your ways of love, justice, and peace. As we turn from our self-centered ways and open ourselves to God's mercy, we find meaning for our lives and hope for our future. My friends, hear and remember the good news of the gospel. In the work and ways of Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, we are forgiven and freed to live as his servants in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on do not sin again. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in our morning prayer. Let us pray together. Creator God, you made all things in your wisdom, and in your love you save us. We pray for the whole creation. Overthrow evil powers, right what is wrong, feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice, so that all your children may freely enjoy the earth you have made, and joyfully sing your praises. Let us pray for the world. Gracious God, you have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service as the body of Christ, proclaiming the good news to the world that all may believe 
you are love. Turn to your ways and live in the light of your truth. Let us pray for the church. Eternal God, you sent us a Savior, Christ Jesus, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace on earth and put down greed, pride, and anger, which turn nation against nation and race against race. Speed the day when wars will end and the whole world will accept your peaceable kingdom. Let us pray for peace. Loving God, whom we cannot love unless we love our neighbors, remove hate and prejudice from us and from all people, so that your children may be reconciled with those we fear, resent, or threaten, and may live together in your peace. Let us pray for our enemies. Mighty God, sovereign over the nations, direct those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give vision to those who govern all countries that, guided by your wisdom, they may lead us in the way of your righteousness and mercy. Let us pray for those who govern. God of wisdom, you give us the gift of learning Bless all those who are beginning a new school year. Children, youth, and adults, teachers, administrators, principals, counselors, coaches, secretaries, tutors, cooks, custodians, nurses, bus drivers, and officers, parents, guardians, family members, and this church community. Be with us as we embark a new way of experiencing school. Calm our nerves, cast out our fears, and fill us with the strength of your spirit. Let us pray for our educational system. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on those who are sick in our church, community, and around the world. Bring healing treatment, and cures to all as we suffer through this pandemic. Strengthen health care workers and scientists as they work to bring an end to our current suffering. Let us pray for healing. God of comfort, stand with those who grieve and mourn, that they may be sure that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, shall separate them from your love in Christ Jesus. Let us pray for those who sorrow. God of compassion, bless us and those we love, that drawing close to you, we may be drawn closer to each other and share your faithful covenant love. Let us pray for our loved ones. God of light, in you there is no darkness at all. Help us to acknowledge sins instead of deceiving ourselves and trying to cast stones at others. Then we can confess and be forgiven that we may walk in the light with you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who died and rose again for us and for the whole world, and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> I want to
scripture lesson this morning comes from the letter of 1st John chapter 1 verse 5 through chapter 2 verse 2 this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all if we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness we lie and do not do what is true but if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ 
the righteous. And He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I'd like to introduce my daughter, Lydia, who is eight years old. Lydia, you want to say hello? Hi. And Lydia and I are going to talk a little bit about this scripture that, that we read it together this week, and it seemed to have some things in it that really applied to you and me, mm -hmm. especially as we've been spending so much time together over the past few months. Yeah, the time it's been crazy. It has been crazy. We've been locked up at home, um, which has everything been perfect with us at home all the time, every day, everyone gets along? Absolutely not. If you and sister are fighting, if you're having an argument, and dad comes in, right? Usually dad comes stomping down the hall, mm -hmm, just like that. And he comes in and he says, Lydia, go to timeout. I'm like, what do you say? Lily's fault. I didn't do much. I just like said like, hey, you you gotta go there, and that's all I did. I don't deserve this. If anyone's going to time out, it should be Lily. Uh -huh. Yeah, something. And I'll like and I'll point out. I'll say, Lydia, I saw you push her, yeah. and you'll still say. But she did this to me first. Right. <laughs> And so you often want to tell me that, that you don't deserve any kind of punishment and you did nothing wrong. Yes, but that's like the opposite of what happens. When you're about to get in trouble, when dads or mom come in and they see the girls fighting and you're getting sent to timeout, why is it that you have a hard time admitting what you've done wrong? I'm pretty sure this happens with a lot of people. It's that you feel like if you prove, if you say that you're guilty, um, you will get punished, 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 punished. Yeah, you're afraid of getting in trouble. Afraid of us knowing you did something bad. Oh wait. Two, but, oh, okay. But what happens? Do you usually get in just as much trouble for lying about it? As you do for whatever it is you did. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even more. Yeah. So if you're trying to have a good relationship with your sister and, and you've done something that hurt her, you need to kind of admit that and, and tell her you're wrong for that to, for y'all's relationship to get better. Mm -hmm. Right? And what about with you and dad? What about those times when dad says to you, Lydia, you made me lose my temper. Is dad taking responsibility for losing his yeah, temper? He's like, you, 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 you. It's you are the one who made me so mad. You are in so much trouble. Yeah. I mm -hmm. hear that all. I hear that every time I go to the timeout. And I'm like. But then there are some times when I come in and I say, Lydia, I'm sorry I lost my temper with you. And that makes me feel like I should probably say sorry to him and to Lily and, or like whoever I did bad to. Which of those ways of me talking helps us get back to a right relationship? Number two. Number two. Let's put this arm down and feel like you might fly away. <laughs> so if I'm able to come to you and admit that I overreacted, that I made mistakes in the way I was parenting, it helps our relationship get back to right, doesn't it? Uh -huh. It's actually how I can try to be a better parent mm -hmm. is when I admit that, hey, I wasn't, I didn't do this right, and I'm sorry, and I should be a better dad to you. And that's what helps our relationship get stronger. And isn't that kind of what we read in the scripture? Yeah. That if we want a better relationship with God, if we want to be in the light as God is in the light, what do we have to do? If 
you want to be forgiven by God or be forgiven, you have to admit that it's your fault for what you did. Not somebody else made you and I, it, I just started doing it. It's your fault, you did whatever. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, if we admit God gets super angry at us. No, he usually forgives us. God knows what we did and he wants us to tell him that we did it. Because he already knows that we did that's right. God already knows. So when we confess what we've done wrong, we're not telling God something God doesn't know. Yeah, because he already... Who is it that we're actually telling? Us. We're admitting to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what lets God right. change us. That's how God brings us into the light, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's how our relationship with God gets made right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you and I should keep working on our relationship mm -hmm. so that it's even better. And I'll try to be a better dad. I'll try to be a better daughter and sister. <laughs> All right. Can I have a hug? Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you want to live in the kingdom of light that God has made for us, then you have to be willing to do the hard work of introspection, of looking deep within ourselves to see the ways that our lives are entangled with the sin of the world. If we desire to be in the light, as God is in the light, then we have to find those places within us that are still inside the shadow, where the darkness remains. And that's a scary, pros scary prospect. Like Lydia and I struggling to admit our own faults and, and wanting to blame others, we often want to find some way to get out of it, to just pick up the label of Christian. And as long as we can say that we're a Christian, then we must be right, that we don't really have to change, that we've somehow made ourselves righteous by wearing this label. But just like Lydia and I want to blame others instead of addressing our own faults when we don't treat each other with love and respect, that's not the way to move forward. This letter we call 1 John tells us some important things about this impulse that we all have to, to deflect and not address the darkness within. The first thing we learn is that it's nothing more than self-deception. To blame others or to compare ourselves to others, it, we're just trying to prove ourselves to be in the right. We're trying to make ourselves feel better about ourselves and ignore what's really happening. It's only a way to distract us from the truth of the sin that we have. As a dad, I hear the excuse all the time. When I say Lydia, I hear, but Lily. When I say Liliana, I hear, but, but Lydia did. It's the same that we do. When someone points out something to us, we want to say, well, what about them? We want to say, it's not my fault. I didn't do this. And, and the thing is, I'm as quick to blame others as my children are at times. I want to blame my anger and my loss of control on Lydia's bad behavior or Liliana's bad choices. But in all of this, we're just deceiving ourselves. We're doing mental gymnastics to let ourselves off the hook and pretend we don't have sin in our lives. The second thing we learn in this passage about this, this habit we have is that this self-deception actually keeps us from entering into the light. By pretending we are perfect little Christians, 
we keep ourselves from being perfected. We actually keep ourselves from becoming the people we're pretending to be. John uses light as this symbol for living with God, for sharing communion with Christ. Being in the light and participating in God's kingdom are one and the same. And every time you justify yourself, and do whatever you have to do to make yourself feel better about yourself, you're implying that you are the one that makes yourself right, and not Christ. You're saying that Christ's death and resurrection weren't really even necessary for you. And you can't accept Jesus as your Savior if you deny that you actually need saving. And as long as you deny these sins, as long as we pretend there's no darkness in us, then these places are allowed to take root. They're allowed to fester. As long as I blame Lydia's disobedience on my... As long as I blame Lydia's disobedience for my loss of control, my temper then I'll never be able to improve as a father. As long as we keep our sins in the dark, then they hold sway over us. They keep us from knowing God fully and experiencing the life of joy and peace and love that Jesus has made possible for us. Now, the, the best thing that we learn from this passage is that that life of joy and peace and love is possible. Jesus has made it possible, and God will forgive us. Of all the things that keep us from entering into that kingdom, God can remove those things from us and longs to do so. When we confess our sins and come clean about the places in our life that need light, and resurrection, then we can experience God's forgiveness. I mean, God's already done the forgiving. But when we offer our sinfulness, our darkness to God, God can set us free from those sins and, and turn that darkness into light. Those places that are hard to see and, and don't function properly because there's not enough light, God shines there and changes us. We don't have to be afraid of God finding out our sins. God already knows them, as even Lydia told us today. Our confession, it doesn't change God's view of us, but it can change our view of ourselves and our view of God. Our confession, then, allows God to start transforming us. We are able to move more fully into the light where we can see and then relinquish these shadows. It's as true for our faith as it is for my parenting or any other aspect of life. That if you want to solve a problem, you first have to acknowledge that it's a problem. Now, I could stop here. As a, as a younger man earlier in my preaching career, this is where I would have called it quits. I would have ended with each of us looking at our own individual sins and knowing that God will forgive us. But if I do that, I end up ignoring some crucial parts of this passage. Parts like, we have fellowship with one another. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. When John was talking about this faith, this being in the light, he wasn't talking about an individualistic faith. John didn't believe that somehow our relationship to God and my forgiveness exist inside some little bubble that's disconnected from everyone else. 
Jesus didn't die for just one person's sins, but for the world's sins. The light of God is not meant just to shine on me, but upon all of us, upon the whole world. And there are ways that we live together in our society that still, that still support darkness and shadows. To ignore the communal nature of our sins and how other people's sins have impacts on our lives and the lives of others, it's just another way for us to deceive ourselves. If we ignore the patterns of injustice in our society and claim that we didn't cause these problems, they're not our fault, they're not our responsibility, and that we didn't set these issues in place and therefore we don't have a responsibility in setting them right, we're deceiving ourselves. We're keeping ourselves from entering into the light. And that same fear that had Lydia afraid of admitting she'd made a bad choice, it haunts us when it comes to these issues about admitting that our free and just society has privileged some of us at the expense of others. And whether it's our race or our gender or our wealth or even our religion, most of us have in one way or another, and maybe in many ways, benefited from a society that marginalized others and protected and privileged the few. As long as we deny that, as long as we deny these ongoing effects of this sinfulness in our society, we will never be able to make the changes necessary to move our society more fully into the light. We will not have that fellowship with one another John was talking about. It won't be possible as long as we deny what's happening. But Jesus came to redeem all of the sins of the whole world. In our society, it has plenty of darkness. And we have to confess that, to acknowledge that, and then to pray for God to show us how to become a better community, one that more closely resembles the kingdom of God. For these changes to happen, it will assuredly take God's work in our world, miraculous intervention of God and God's Spirit penetrating into our lives in ways that haven't been normal for us. These problems, they're just too big for us to think that we can solve on our own, that any one of us could make one choice and one decision and, and somehow bring about the change we need. But until we admit that we are a part of the problem, that we've participated in these things, then God can't use us to be a part of the solution. But God is longing for that. God is longing to bring us into the light. God is light. And in God there is no darkness, no hiding within this clear light that reveals who we really are. But in the light of God, we also see all people for who they are, the children of God. We see how we can be in fellowship with people of all races and creeds and nationalities. And we find that these shadows that have lingered on our souls we can offer them to God and be cleansed of them. We can be in the light as God is in the light. So let the light of God cleanse us and renew us and make us whole.
I want to invite you today to step out of the darkness and step into God's light, into God's life. For God loves us so much that he gave us his son, Jesus Christ, who on the wonderful cross made it possible that we might enter into this life and this light where we have fellowship with our neighbor and communion with God. This is the life God wants us to lead. So let us turn to the light and be made new.